Welcome to Yankee Stadium. Perhaps no Yankee of recent vintage has been more polarizing to fans than Alex Rodriguez. Acquired as the reigning MVP in 2004, Alex played in over 1,500 games with the Yankees, mashing 351 home runs and winning two more Most Valuable Player awards. Despite these accolades, though, scrutiny and controversy surrounded him both on and off the field. Tonight, I am joined by one of my personal favorite podcast hosts, Yankees Twitter legend and self-proclaimed A-Rod historian, Emily Nyman of Breaking Balls podcast, to break down A-Rod's legacy and some other stuff. It's a ton of fun. Let's get started. I'm Derek. This is The Freeze. So jealous of your podcast title, uh, the double entendre, <laughs> breaking balls, but also breaking balls. Uh, I've named a few things in my time. I got to say nothing half that good. That's hilarious. Thank you. I am going to be honest. I was pretty psyched when I thought of it. Although I'm just sitting on the couch and I literally had like a light bulb moment where it was just like, oh my God, breaking balls. And my fiance, who's the producer of my podcast, we were both like, oh my God, we did it. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's fantastic. Um, I've been listening to a while, and obviously you're a uh, Twitter legend. Uh, oh. So for for Yankees universe anyway, um, your Twitter bio says a Rod historian, and you spoke about a Rod in your most recent podcast. So I just wanted to have you on to kind of discuss a Rod's career, some of the highs and lows, and really get in depth about his legacy while we got nothing going on in the baseball world. So. What comes to mind when you think of A-Rod other than not such a great announcer? (laughs) Oh, man. I mean, I I always – because a lot comes to mind when I think of A-Rod. He's been my favorite player for basically as long as I can remember. Um, But believe it or not, the first thing that comes to mind is that stupid gif where he's head slid into second base, like puts his hand on his hip and like smiles, (laughs) has that just dumb smile on his face. So I always think of that. But just, I think of, and to be like a little deeper on it, I just, I think he's such a nerd and he's such like a bozo and a clown, but he's just also such a gifted athlete. And I think that he's a really polarizing figure, obviously, but he's just such an interesting character in the history of American sports and especially in the history of this game, in my opinion. Yeah, I think when the Yankees got him, the fans kind of expected him to be 12 foot tall and bulletproof. You know, we expected him to be perfect because he was the best player in baseball. It's like if we went out right now and got Trout or Otani or something, Yankees fans would expect them to be perfect and to come through in the clutch every single time. But looking back on A-Rod's career in retrospect, especially with the Yankees, there's a lot of great moments. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff. There's a lot of good stuff. What comes to mind for you as some of your favorite kind of high points i mean obviously that two run home run in the bottom of the ninth off joe nathan in the 2009 alds uh, tied the game um uh, he had a pretty big home run i believe uh, against the angels a few years prior i also was at his last game and he had an rbi double which was his last hit and i that was just really magical to say I know it wasn't quite Jeter's last hit magic but for A-Rod it was it was pretty fun his grand slam in uh on April 7th 2007 oh the, yeah uh, Orioles where he guy pointed to the sky did like the uh what's that guy's name I forget the name of the pitcher now who does it but pointed up and it was just an absolute bomb to dead center field so just just home runs basically and also I'm a little my memory is skewed because I've seen so many of like just his home run highlight videos in the last yeah. few years since he's been retired. So shout out to Dan Rourke. Yeah. Um, so when I think about a rod, I mean, I, I think the joyous moments are what I remember the most. I, when we traded for a rod in Oh four, I remember it was right around this time of year. It was right around Valentine's day. That's why I wanted to come out with this uh, in mid February. It was one of the happiest moments of my life. I mean, 
when I heard that they were getting a rod, I almost shit my pants. Like I, I, <laughs> I went through the, and I don't swear much on this channel, but like, I, I lost it. And then, um, you know, Oh, four wasn't a great year. Obviously the Yankees went down after, um, being up Oh three in the playoffs. But if you remember a rod, he took a lot of the blame, but he got them through the series prior. He got them through that ALDS against the twins. He had a big hit late in the game. And then he was actually pretty good in that series up until game four. He had a couple of home runs. I thought it was going great for him, but then he had like a three or four year down stretch beginning with game four. So I, I feel like just the way that season ended kind of hurt a rod's legacy because they were supposed to win it all. And that failure kind of got pinned on him a little bit unfairly. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, his legacy would be a lot different. I mean, it's hard to say because baseball, I know it sounds stupid, but baseball aside, his legacy is obviously tainted by his performance enhancing drug usage. So that has put a shroud of darkness over his entire legacy. But with that being said, if they had won that series in Boston and then probably went on to win the world series that year, because of who, who the Red Sox beat the Cardinals or something, some yeah. national league team that just had no shot he would have been beloved and the reaction would have been a lot different. Even if he struggled then after that, the same yeah. way that he did in the postseason, he would have still had that under his belt. So the reaction from fans, when the news came out about the PEDs may not have been re received as negatively as it was because New York fans were used to, you know, it's like PEDs at that time. It wasn't that crazy. So it was just right. like uh, everyone, but or, everyone already hated him. So it was just yeah. like the best excuse for people to be like, oh, okay, now it's right. okay for me to hate him. I was going to say, it, feel, it always felt like people were looking for a reason to, to hate A-Rod. If it wasn't the salary and the contract, it was, you know, stuff he was doing off the field. When Jeter was doing arguably worse stuff off the field, if you're, you know, and, uh, and, and he was the golden child. But A-Rod a always caught, the grief from people. And I just feel like he was tra treated a little bit unfairly. Let's jump a little bit ahead in his career. Um, because again, I remember the joyous moments. I remember how he bounced back in 2005, won an MVP. 2006 was probably, in, in my opinion, the low point. That was yeah, the- We don't uh, talk about that year. <laughs> that was a rough year. I mean, wasn't that the Jeter A-Rod pop-up year where it just kind of dropped in, in between them? You know, it might have been where then Jeter like gave him a look like, come on, yeah. guy. It's like, Jeter, you're the shortstop. So maybe you should call for the ball. But and I promise, yeah. folks watching, I'm not trying to turn this uh, into a Jeter hate fest. I love Jeter. I love A-Rod, <laughs> yeah, too. I love him, too. <laughs> uh, I I'm just trying to, to point out that, you know, uh, it, it was kind of a roller coaster ride. 2007, though, the, the, when I think of A-Rod, besides getting him in 04, I think of that month, the entire month of April of 07. The Yankees were horrible in the beginning of that year and a rod carry them 14 home runs. And I think 37 RBIs in April, he hits two walk-off home runs coming off of a postseason in which everybody talked about how unclutch he was. He comes out right away and says, take that. He takes, I think his name was uh, Ray, Chris Ray, maybe um, for the Orioles deep uh, with that grand slam. Yeah, he hit one sick. against the, the Indians. He hits 54 home runs, and then the Yankees go quietly in the playoffs. A-Rod does hit a home run, and then he opts out. What were you thinking when he opted out? Um, I remember, actually, I, was, I remember where I was in my parents' house watching that World Series, and I was like, oh, I don't want to curse on your channel. I was like, oh, my <laughs> God. Like, this, is, this guy just, he can't help himself. Like, he can't help. I get why he did it, but – he always wanted to be that guy. He always wanted to be the popular guy. He wanted to be the guy that everyone loved, but then he would do things like that. And then it's like, no, no one's surprised why everyone hates you now because you make things about yourself. And even if it wasn't him, even if it was, you know, at the advice of his agent, which I'm sure it was, it was just like, again, like, and I even felt that way when he came to the team, I was really excited, but I would have people heckle me at Yankee stadium wearing an A-Rod jersey. So when that happened, I was like, fuck, like now it's just another thing that I'm gonna have to defend and why it's not that big of a deal, but that's A-Rod. <laughs>
So let's jump ahead a little further. 2008, another tough year. Tough year for the Yankees. They missed the playoffs for the first time since 1994 when there were no playoffs. 1993 when there was a full season. And then 2009, uh, he, he somehow, after missing the first month of the season, homers on the first pitch that he sees against the Orioles, three-run shot, kind of sets the tone for his season. There's all the steroid controversy that year, and he just ignores it and carries the Yankees through the playoffs, wins a World Series. To me, that's obviously the high point of his time with the Yankees. But that's another thing. When I think about his legacy, and and maybe it's just like I'm a glasses half full person, I think of 04, I think of 07, and then I think of him holding up the championship trophy. I mean, that's that's where my mind goes. Uh, Talk about A-Rod in 09. Well, you know, people don't give him enough credit. And I'm really glad that you said that, that because that article about him using PEDs, I came out in, I believe it was February of that right. year. So I think that he doesn't get enough credit for, like you said, for really bearing down and focusing despite the rabbit being pulled out of the hat on that one and, and then being exposed. So I, I really, it was really special because Hey, Rod, he could have stayed in Texas for the rest of his career. He could have just hit, you know, his 700 home runs quietly where no one cares about him in Arlington and, and not had the glitz of New York City and the pressure of New York City and the Yankees in particular, especially during that time. And he wanted more. He wanted a, a title. And it's he gets a lot of flack for being like, oh, like as if he's a me first guy. But that's what he came to New York to do was to win that World Series. So obviously I was happy for myself because it was the first world series that I witnessed as like uh, a young adult. I was 22 at the time. And it was just nice to, for him to get that monkey off of his back. And especially of all years for it to be the year where that article and that book came out about him and the PEDs, and then everything started to unravel really for him after that. But fortunately it was now on the downswing of his career. So I think that his career had a lot of, um, a lot of ups and downs, probably more downs and ups. Well, not counting all the money he made, but <laughs> I think that 2009, no one can take that away from him. So you made a couple of good points that I want to talk about. One, if he had stayed in Arlington and he had a full no trade clause, he didn't have to come to the Yankees. He could have probably made the hall of fame. He probably would, would have been elected in the hall of fame this year if he had not been traded. I mean, do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I think that it definitely would have kept him out of the spotlight a lot more. Yeah. So I don't know if, um, you know, that woman that wrote that book, like that expose book that then led to that Sports Illustrated article, I don't know if that necessarily would have come to fruition the way it did. But it's hard to say because yeah. he was the highest paid player in North American sports history at the time. That's true. So That's true. The spotlight was still on him. But I mean, like, you know, Ortiz, he had the negative test. You talked about this in your last episode, uh, the January 29th episode titled Hall of Very Good for anybody who's watching and doesn't listen to your podcast, which, by the way, they should. It's great. Uh, you guys have great, uh, very intellectual discussions. I, I, I always enjoy listening. Um, the, the issue with David Ortiz is that he tested positive for you know, steroids in, in a sort of anonymous way, just like a rod supposedly, but then the commissioner comes out and defends him. And yet nobody ever defended a rod after that. Right. I mean, it just, it just feels like a, a double standard to me. It feels, it feels like once again, a rod is, is getting the shaft. Yeah. And it's, I really appreciate you saying all this because it's really difficult to bring up because at the end of the day, it's Alex Rodriguez, you know, three-time MVP, made half a billion dollars in his career. So like, it's tough to, you know, really swing, like sing like a, the swan song for him, but he didn't have anyone defend him. And I really believe that things wouldn't have panned out the way they did if that didn't push the snowball down the hill because right. it, the test got leaked and a was named on it. And then, I mean, we see it now, even to today with major league baseball that they love to, scapegoat someone you know they they know that the, a problem is pervasive in the entire league but this is the team or this is the player that got caught by the public so we're now going to make an example out of them and pretend like now the big bad uh player or team is now taken care of and now 
baseball is whole again. So with A-Rod, that was their chance. They were like, no one really likes him anyway. You know, so let's go after this guy, make an example out of him. And then he'll like signify the end of the PED era. So people love to say like, oh, well, you know, he then got caught and, and he had the, the biogenesis thing that Ortiz didn't have. Well, Ortiz also wasn't targeted by Major League Baseball and Seelig and Manfred at the time. So I think that if A-Rod were more beloved, it may not have gone down like that. And I think that's what saved Ortiz is that there was no way the league was going to let Ortiz and that story of the Red Sox go down because after the home run race, that was the next big thing to like bring more vibrance to the league because everyone was tired of the Yankees winning. So that was it. And they were going to protect that no matter what. And you got into this in your last podcast episode too. You talked about, I don't know if it's your last, I don't know if you've released a new one since then. It's the last one I listened to, but nine years left of eligibility for A-Rod. The culture can change a lot in nine years. I mean, think about how different the world was nine years ago. Um, I could see the culture changing enough to where he gets in. I I don't think it's going to happen, but, you know, 35%, if he goes up a little bit each year, you know, maybe he gets to that 75%. What do you think? I think that there is a chance because as we start to see some of like the the old guard for lack of a better term of the older sports writers as they start to phase out because after they retire if they're a BBWAA member if I recall correctly they still are allowed to stay on for like another 10 years as a voter because mm-hmm. it, it assumes that I know I agree but it assumes <laughs> that like the players that they saw are going to now be on the ballot for about that long right I guess So I think that as those guys phase out and now new blood starts coming in, hopefully that he will get a chance because at the end of the day, you know, we can either ignore and revise history and act like an entire generation of players didn't happen, or we can just take it for what it is. If they have to denote it on their plaque, whatever, I think he has a chance because even with all the PED guys, he doesn't have any of the other off field bullshit. He doesn't have any, domestic violence issues he doesn't have any of that kind of stuff so if it's just peds but he's treated as like he's the worst possible guy on that ballot and it's crazy to me because some of the stuff that these guys have done that are on there it's like what the ty cobb beat up a guy who had no arms and no legs in the stands (laughs) amazing (laughs) yeah what the (laughs) he did yeah. He, didn't you ever see the Ken Burns documentary? Oh so, so, so this guy, so Ty Cobb is notoriously like the biggest jerk in the history of sports, maybe in the history of humanity. I mean, you know, jury's <laughs> out. but he was a racist. He was horrible. Somebody was yelling at him from the stands and he goes up and just proceeds to pummel the guy. And then like somebody says, Hey, this guy's got no arms. And he says, he says, I don't care if he doesn't have legs. And he just continues to, to pummel the guy. Oh and he God. and then he got suspended by the league and his team refused to play unless the suspension was reinstated and he won the, the, they they dropped the suspension and Ty Cobb is a Hall of Famer so that should that should wrap up our Hall of Fame cred- credibility right there exactly what are we doing uh, <laughs> so we're witnessing the ugly side of sports right now the season is in peril pitchers and catchers were supposed to report today what are your thoughts on the health of the sport? How are you feeling about pitchers and catchers day, which to me is a holiday and we got no pitchers and catchers. Yeah, it's, uh, it's brutal. I will say, I will say though, that 2020 kind of desensitized me to it. So it doesn't feel as awful as missing baseball did in 2020, because that was like the first time ever in yeah. my memory. Cause I was a little kid in 94. So in my memory that something like that happened. So now that that just happened, this doesn't hurt as bad for me, but man, I'm still depressed. And it's still like, what the, what am I going to do for the next few months? <laughs> and as far as the state of the sport, like the health of the sport, it's hard for me to say just because I'm a diehard, like you are that I'm not going anywhere. Everyone I talk to on Twitter, who's taking time out of their lives in the off season to still discuss baseball is not going anywhere. And for casuals, do they really care enough to like <laughs> not come back and watch because of this or are they casuals yeah. and they'll still going to come back and watch? I think that depends on how much of the season is missed. I mean, if you settle this thing up and you miss a couple of weeks of spring training, 
I don't think any of the casuals are going to disappear. But if you're out till Memorial Day, you might. I, I remember in, in 94, I was 11 years old. And, and so I was at the point in my life where the kids who sat around me in my class were Yankees fans, Mets fans, Braves fans, like the, the big teams, a couple of Indians fans in there. Uh, and a few of them just didn't come back after the strike. Like after the strike, they just started following football or, you know, that was the time when the NFL was like at its peak too. And, you know, I just feel like we lost some people. There were some great hockey teams. I think the Rangers won the Stanley cup in 94, 95. So we're like, I don't follow hockey, but uh, it was right around that time. And I feel like at least in my area, baseball and the Yankees in particular bled some fans by canceling a season that, you know, was three quarters of the way through because people were supposed to go. They were supposed to have family trips. A lot of my friends would go for Memorial day. The little league teams used to go and we just didn't get it that year. And it was just, uh, it was a damn shame. Yeah. That's a really good point. And also what major league baseball has and, and every other pro sport is working against them is the choices for entertainment, especially for little kids that when we were kids, cause you're around the same age as I am there, they were like starting to gear entertainment towards kids they had nickelodeon and whatever but now they have so many options for how to entertain themselves so right. they're already at a disadvantage as far as kids and they don't help themselves with all of the antiquated tradition and stuff that will hold the game back that the nfl and the nba have been able to corner the market on and now this so you do make a good point but I feel like as soon as the season recesses and we're back to next year, it'll be business as usual. People will come back. All right. So let's say that the lockout did end tomorrow. And for some reason, Hal Steinbrenner <laughs> dictated, you get to uh, control the team and, and reassemble this roster for the season. What moves are you trying to make? Who's out there that you are, you really want to see play in pinstripes? Well, I would love to see Carlos Correa play for the Yankees I would really love to see them sign him to a long deal and have him for the rest of his prime years um but I am also realistic and been a Yankee fan for the last few years so I don't know if that's necessarily going to happen and I would also be happy with story Trevor story especially if they made a trade for Olsen you know oh, yeah. I, I love Luke Voigt but I don't know if he's really a good fit for the team he's kind of if he doesn't hit, then he's totally useless because he right. can't field. So I would he be happy run. to get rid of him. <laughs> right. I'm like, let's trade him as I explain yeah. why he has no trade value. Right. Uh, you know what? I like Luke Voy. I bet he's a, a great guy to hang out with. He seems like a great clubhouse guy and he can hit the ball a mile, but he's, I mean, he's kind of a redundancy is like an unathletic right handed hitter who gets injured a lot. You know what I mean? And I just, yeah. I've, I've had Matt Olson on my personal wish list. I've made umpteen videos about different reasons they should get Matt Olson. I'm liking the Freddie Freeman rumors just because that tells me they're either interested in Matt Olson or they might actually be into Freddie Freeman, who I think would be a good fit. He's a good player. He's a little bit older, but I think, you know, just the way he, he makes contact and he runs the base as well. He plays good defense. Either of those guys would be good. I still think they need another pitcher too. I like Rodon. Yeah, I wouldn't hate that either. The pitching, they were, I think they finished what, like in the top five. As yeah, I think far there were three. All yeah. the major categories. So pitching, if we can get some guys to go a little bit longer, maybe not tax the bullpen as much, I think that would really work for us. But pitching is what kept us in last season. You yeah. know what I mean? So I, I would be okay if they didn't do anything either. I wouldn't be too upset about it. After they got Garrett Cole, I'm like, just do whatever you guys want. Yeah. That, that was like one of the best days in recent memory. So yeah, that was the uh, that was what founded NYY Recaps. I hopped on to talk a little bit about that. Just I had been doing some like shitty movie channel and like trying to make videos about movies just because I like making videos. And I decided to just like get on and talk about Garrett Cole and like a bunch of people watched. So I was like, oh, maybe I should talk more Yankee stuff. And there it goes. I guess I guess uh, there was not enough baseball content out there. So go figure. All right, I'm going to veer off course here because I know we're running low on time. Is it, is it okay if we go a little bit over? Yeah. Okay, cool. So I I love your podcast. Um, it, it's uh, The production is really well done. You guys sound great, which is something that's underrated. Like a lot of people have podcasts, but not everybody takes the time to make it really sound good. Even I'm guilty of not being as much of an audiophile as I can. I'm more focused on the visual aspect because I'm in a visual medium. But nobody 
starts the podcast without being a fan of other podcasts. So I kind of wanted to find out like who your inspirations were, who do you listen to? What are some other podcasts that I could check out that other people should check out? So let's talk podcasting a second. To be honest, I, I had never listened to any sports podcasts. I had listened to Serial, which was a really popular one, and uh, S-Town and um, Case mm -hmm. File, like true crime stuff. And that was like my first foray into podcasting. And then the pandemic happened. And my fiance, who's in radio production, he's who takes the time to edit our show and make it sound as professional as it does. He really encouraged me because I had been you know, sharing my opinion about baseball on various social medias and my following was growing and people were really caring about my opinion and what I had to say. So he was like, you should do a podcast. We have the time now we're locked down. And I was scared at first, but then I was like, you know what, let me just go for it. Like if no one listens, no one listens, but it was the best decision I ever made. And even if you don't listen to podcasts that much, I'm, I'm saying this on a podcast, but I guess people who are listening do, yeah. but if you want to create content, just do it. Like that's, just do it because you won't regret it. Yeah. Um, it, it, you're, it's really good. I mean, it, it's really good. It, it, 20,000 downloads. Congratulations. That's nothing to uh, shake a stick at. Uh, so I'm going to veer even further. We're going to just drive this thing further into the ditch. Um, I, people like a little bit of off topic stuff. I always ask my guests weird stuff. I got Brian Hoke and Jack Curry with UFOs. I'm going to get you. Um, do you believe in ghosts? You know, this is something I say no to, but uh -huh. then I have had plenty of times in my life where I'm like, what was that? So I feel like maybe subconsciously I kind of do, though I did test the theory recently because according to some people on Twitter, I was, quote, pissing on the legacy of Babe Ruth and the like for some mm -hmm. of my opinions, which I stand by that I wasn't. But I feel like if I was, he would have been haunting me by now because I've said the things that I was saying a lot. So I'm going to stick with, no, I don't believe in ghosts. Do you fear AI at all? Just the, the way that the world is kind of adopting this super machine that could possibly destroy us all. Do you think the, the Terminator robots are coming? I mean, every time I see that shit, I'm like, have they not seen all the sci-fi movies? This does not end well for humanity. <laughs> like they're making robots that like have human reactions and shit like that boston land oh yeah like, boston dynamics out of boston, right of course oh, it's out of boston nothing good and comes yeah. from boston no i mean it's we're gonna it's all gonna make life a lot easier until suddenly it makes life a living hell and i feel like that's gonna happen overnight at some point yeah i i think that there's probably the way ai is gonna develop is we're gonna go up and up and up and everybody's gonna have their own like you know digital like you know, an entire wall of like digital computer that just adjusts their house and you can send for your car and you summon the, your groceries and, and a drone drops it off and you never have to worry about anything until somebody hacks the code and we have killer machines like in that Black Mirror episode that just chase you around. And then, you know, one day you're just, you find yourself, you know, bunkered down in a cave with all the, the, the robot demons outside. Yeah, it, it gives me nightmares. It's gonna be like it's gonna be like Space Odyssey. Like you're gonna ask your house to like turn the lights on. It's gonna be like, I'm sorry, no, I can't sorry. do that, Derek. <laughs> um, all right, final question. I ask everybody this question: If you had, because you can you can tell a lot about somebody by the answer. You had one at bat in Yankee Stadium, full capacity crowd. What music you got playing as your walk up to get you pumped up? My favorite song of all time, the Dipset Anthem by the Diplomats. I'm dating myself with that big time. I'm not, but... familiar. I'm not familiar with it. I'm going to have to Google that one. Oh, my God. You're going to recognize it as soon as you hear it. I, so I'm, not great with song. I'm not great with song titles. I'll call it like the Ding Ding song or something like, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, my, any kind of titles like my wife will laugh at me because we'll try and think of like a movie name and I'll rattle off like rapid fire 15 names of this movie and I'll get further and further away. And like, I tried to, what was the movie? I can't even remember the name of it now. I think it was called like, uh, I, it was the one where the woman is like, she's working in like a, a lab and there's a man who's like a half fish monster and it won best picture. And I call it fish sexy. Oh. <laughs> a shape of water shape of yeah, water shape of water that's, i i call it fish sexy that's how fish i landed up <laughs> that was its working title <laughs> that was the word oh that's fantastic uh emily nyman is it nyman or neiman 
It's Nyman. Nyman, that's what I thought. Emily Nyman, thanks so much for joining. Everyone go listen to the Breaking Balls or Breaking Balls podcast available wherever you get podcasts. Fantastic quality, great discussion. Thanks for joining. Thanks so much for having me. This is awesome.